The morning sun streamed through the windows of our tiny apartment, casting long golden beams onto the wooden floor. I woke up beside Madison, my partner in life and adventure. Today was the day we'd been waiting for, the day we'd leave behind the skyscrapers, endless traffic, and the numbing humdrum of city life. I can't believe we're actually doing this, Madison murmured, sleep still lacing her voice as she rolled over to face me. She had a look of raw excitement in her eyes, an emotion I shared wholeheartedly. We both craved the solace and serenity of the wilderness. Our bags were already packed and waiting by the door. We had meticulously organized everything, camping gear, clothes, food supplies, a map of the national park we were venturing into. The park was a vast stretch of untouched wilderness, with acres of pine forest and pristine lakes, a sanctuary where nature thrived without the touch of civilization. It was a place where we hoped to reconnect with ourselves and each other. We loaded up our old pickup, the trusty vehicle we had used for countless road trips. As I locked the apartment door, I felt a sense of relief washing over me. The city had its charms, but the constant clamor and ceaseless pace often felt suffocating. The drive was long, filled with the thrill of anticipation. We shared stories, jokes, and silence, watching as the cityscape gradually gave way to rolling hills, open fields, and eventually, towering trees. There was a certain rhythm to the road, and the landscape that felt calming, hypnotic. I couldn't help but feel a sense of contentment as we plunged deeper into the wilderness. Once we reached the entrance to the park, a shiver of anticipation ran down my spine. We were finally here. The national park was even more beautiful than the pictures we'd seen. The sun was beginning its descent, casting a golden hue across the vast expanse of pines and undergrowth. The air smelled different here, like damp earth and pine needles, tinged with the freshness of the nearby lake. We found a perfect campsite near the lake, secluded but with an open view of the water. Setting up the tent together was a familiar dance. Madison unpacked our gear while I collected firewood. By the time I returned, our tent was up, and the smell of coffee brewing filled the air. Sitting by the campfire, under a sky bursting with stars, felt like a dream. We cooked a simple meal, shared stories, and enjoyed the absolute silence. It was different from the city's quiet, which was often filled with distant sirens, car horns, and the hum of electricity. Here, the silence was pure, only punctuated by the occasional rustle of wind through the trees or the lapping of waves against the lake's shore. As we crawled into our tent that night, the cool forest air seeping in, I felt a sense of peace I hadn't experienced in a long time. We were far from the city, its lights, noise, and demands. Here, it was just Madison, me, and the endless wilderness. That first night, we fell asleep to the gentle lullaby of nature, unaware of the uncanny events that awaited us in the days to come. The morning sun filtered through the forest canopy, casting speckled shadows on our tent. The scent of pine was stronger now, mixed with the crisp morning air, which felt clean and invigorating. I opened my eyes to find Madison already awake, her gaze lost in the beauty of our surroundings. We made the right choice, didn't we, Jack? She asked, her eyes reflecting the serenity around us. I nodded, pulling her close, our silent agreement echoing in the stillness. The day was ours to explore. After a quick breakfast, we decided to venture deeper into the forest. With our map and compass, we ventured into the wilderness, its silent beauty enticing us. The national park was more than we had ever imagined. There was a tangible sense of calm that settled over us as we wandered, the modern world's worries left far behind. The forest was a verdant spectacle, with tall pine trees towering over us and their soft needles carpeting the ground. The sounds of distant bird calls echoed through the woods, and every so often, a gentle breeze would pass, making the trees whisper in soft susurrations. We found a trail that led us to the edge of a tranquil lake. It was picture perfect, a still clear expanse that mirrored the forest and the sky. We dipped our toes into the cool water, sending ripples across the lake's glassy surface. The simple act felt liberating, the chill reminding us of our disconnect from the mundane urban life. As we journeyed further, Madison spotted a deer, its elegant form was partially hidden behind a cluster of trees. It looked at us for a moment before it darted away into the dense undergrowth. 
There was something remarkably peaceful about the sighting, a reminder that we were merely guests in this lush kingdom. By late afternoon, we returned to our campsite. We gathered wood for a fire and prepared our dinner. The act of cooking outdoors, surrounded by nature, was satisfying in a primal way. We feasted on canned beans and grilled sandwiches, the food somehow tasting better in the open air. As night fell, we lit a campfire. The flames flickered and danced, casting long, unpredictable shadows around us. Madison pulled out her guitar, her fingers strumming a familiar tune as we sat, entranced by the play of firelight and music. It felt as if we were part of an old story, one where humans lived in harmony with nature. We laughed, shared stories, and even sang, the sound of our voices merging with the nocturnal symphony of the wilderness. Under the canopy of countless stars, we felt small yet profoundly connected to the universe. Our city lives seemed distant, another world that didn't belong to us at the moment. Retreating into our tent, the nocturnal sounds of the forest lulling us to sleep, we felt safe and at peace. The serene wilderness was our home, if only for a while, and we planned to embrace it entirely. Little did we know how quickly serenity could slip into terror, and how our perception of the wilderness was about to be drastically altered. I woke up in the dead of night, a strange sound piercing the usual calm of the wilderness. It was a soft murmur, almost like a distant conversation. I rubbed my eyes convinced I was dreaming, but the sound persisted. Next to me Madison stirred, her eyes wide and alert. Jack, do you hear that? She whispered, confirming it wasn't just a figment of my imagination. I nodded, sitting upright as we strained our ears in the silent darkness. It sounded like a human voice, an eerie mimicry of our own conversations, muffled and distorted, yet unmistakable. It was coming from the forest, far away but still audible in the silence that cradled our campsite. We exchanged a puzzled glance, neither of us understanding what could be producing such a sound. Maybe another couple was camping nearby, we reasoned. It was a large park after all, and though we had not seen anyone during the day, it wasn't impossible. Still, an unsettling feeling gnawed at me. The voice seemed to be repeating phrases from our conversation earlier that night, the words warped and strange as they echoed through the trees. It didn't make sense, and the feeling of being listened to, even mimicked, sent a shiver down my spine. We decided to investigate, grabbing our flashlights and stepping out of our tent. The night air was colder now, the warmth of our fire reduced to glowing embers. I shone my flashlight towards the forest, half expecting to see a fellow camper or perhaps an animal. But there was nothing, just the tall trees and their shadows that seemed to waver with an unsettling rhythm. The voice ceased as we stood there, scanning the dark wilderness. Silence descended again, heavy and deep, wrapping the forest in its cloak. It was as if the trees themselves held their breath, sharing our confusion and unease. We returned to the tent, more alert now, our hearts beating a quiet rhythm of disquiet. The image of a peaceful night under the stars had been marred by this inexplicable occurrence. We lay awake for a while, whispering theories and possible explanations, but none seemed satisfactory. Finally, fatigue claimed us, and we fell into a restless sleep, the nocturnal creatures serenading our troubled dreams. We decided not to dwell on the strange event, hoping it was a one-time thing. Maybe it was the wilderness playing tricks on us, we thought city dwellers unaccustomed to the true sounds of the wild. We slept with a determination to enjoy the rest of our camping trip. We were far from the city, far from stress, and the last thing we wanted was to let some inexplicable sound dampen our spirits. However, that night marked the beginning of a series of events that would transform our serene escape into a chilling encounter with the uncanny. Our brush with the mysterious voice was merely a prelude to what awaited us in the heart of the wilderness. The day dawned bright and clear, our previous night's disquiet temporarily forgotten in the brilliance of the morning. We set out for a hike, resolving to not let the strange incident cloud our experience. The forest, bathed in golden sunshine, seemed welcoming, the previous night's unease a distant memory. It was during this hike that we saw it, a deer-like creature. I say deer-like because, though its shape and size were similar, there was something off about it. Its eyes, instead of the usual innocent doe-like glint, held a strange intensity, 
an unnerving intelligence that didn't seem natural. Bro. It stood at the edge of a clearing, looking at us, its head cocked to one side as if analyzing us. Madison clutched my arm, whispering, Jack, doesn't that look like the deer we saw yesterday? She was right, that this felt different, somehow otherworldly. And then it made a sound, a laugh. But not just any laugh. It was Madison's laughter from last night, an uncanny reproduction that froze us in our tracks. The sound was jarring, completely out of place, and the mimicry was too perfect, too human. It sent a chilling wave through me, turning my blood cold. We backed away slowly, our eyes locked on the creature. It continued to watch us, its gaze following our every move. As we retreated, it let out another burst of laughter, the echo lingering in the stillness of the forest. The walk back to our campsite was a silent one. Madison clung to my arm, her previous excitement replaced by fear. The tranquil forest now seemed sinister, the rustle of leaves and distant calls of animals serving as a grim reminder of our encounter. Back at the camp, we packed our belongings, deciding to cut our trip short. The initial serenity of the wilderness was tainted by the strange occurrences, turning our peaceful retreat into a nightmare. We thought we could leave in the morning, escape the eerie wilderness and its unnatural inhabitants. That night, we huddled inside our tent, the eerie silence of the forest more menacing than ever. Every rustle, every sound was amplified by our fear, turning the once serene nocturnal symphony into a cacophony of dread. The encounter had left us shaken, questioning the very nature of this wilderness. Our dreams of a peaceful escape seemed foolish now. We lay there, wide awake, praying for dawn, hoping to leave the unsettling events behind us. Yet, as the night deepened, so did our unease. The forest seemed to hold its breath, anticipating the frightful events that were yet to unfold. The terrifying ordeal was just beginning, and we were at the heart of it, in the vast, isolated expanse of the National Park, with a mimicking creature lurking in its depths. Little did we know how drastically our lives were about to change. Our plans to leave at dawn were foiled by an unexpected visit. A knock on the side of our tent jolted us awake from our restless sleep. My heart pounded in my chest, the terrifying thoughts from last night rushing back. Park Rangers, a gruff voice called out. I exhaled, relief washing over me as I unzipped the tent to meet our unexpected guest. Standing before us was a sturdy man in his late fifties, dressed in the green uniform of a park ranger. His eyes were hard and serious, his face marked by years of living amidst the wilderness. He introduced himself as Ranger O'Connor. I noticed your campsite, he said. Thought I'd stop by and see if you folks needed anything. We exchanged glances, deciding whether to tell him about our experiences. Deciding that we had nothing to lose, we narrated the events of the past night and our encounter with the strange creature. The ranger's eyes narrowed as he listened, his serious demeanor taking on a hint of concern. He told us it was most likely a case of misidentification, explaining that forest animals can sometimes mimic human sounds, but the conviction in his voice faltered when we mentioned the deer-like creature's unnatural behavior and unnerving mimicry. His eyes held a flicker of recognition, a silent acknowledgement that suggested he knew more than he was letting on. Ever heard of skinwalkers? He asked, studying our expressions. We shook our heads, the term unfamiliar and strange. He explained that in some Native American legends, skinwalkers are beings who can transform into, mimic and control animals, even mimicking human voices. His words hung in the air, casting a pall over us. It felt too far-fetched, a product of ancient folklore. Yet, there was something about the ranger's tone, a grave seriousness, that made me believe him. Our own encounters lined up with the legend, adding to our discomfort. Ranger O'Connor offered to accompany us back to the park entrance, assuring us that we'd be safe with him. We were more than grateful. The prospect of escaping the terrifying wilderness far more appealing than spending another night in fear. We started packing up our campsite, casting uneasy glances at the encircling forest. The ranger kept an eye on the woods, his hand on the pistol holstered at his hip, his presence a comforting barrier between us and the lurking terror. As we began our exodus from the park, a haunting laughter echoed through the forest, a cruel reminder of our encounter. It sounded chillingly similar to my own laugh. I felt my blood turn cold, 
the laughter seeming to follow us as we hurried away. Our escape from the serenity turned nightmare of the national park was just the beginning. As we ventured further into the dense wilderness, we found ourselves plunging deeper into a world where reality and legend intertwined, a world that would test our courage, strength, and the boundaries of our understanding. As we moved deeper into the forest, each step took us farther from the deceptive safety of our campsite and closer to the heart of the uncanny wilderness. Ranger O'Connor led the way, his lantern casting long, dancing shadows that seemed to keep pace with us. The darkness of the forest was absolute, penetrated only by the weak beams of our flashlights and the occasional glimmer of moonlight through the dense canopy. The once soothing sounds of the night now took on a sinister tone, every rustle of leaves or snap of a twig causing us to jump. A low growl echoed through the night, chillingly close, causing us to halt. Ranger O'Connor held up a hand, signaling us to stay silent. His eyes scanned the surrounding darkness, the steady grip on his pistol a testament to his readiness. It's close, he whispered, the grave tone in his voice making my heart pound. There was no denying the fear that crept into our bones, the terror of knowing we were being stalked by something not quite animal, not quite human. A terrifying scream shattered the silence, reverberating through the forest. It was an agonizing mix of Madison's voice and something inhuman, a spine-chilling sound that seemed to be coming from all directions. Despite the terror gripping us, we knew we had to keep moving. If we were to have any chance of escaping this nightmare, we needed to reach the park entrance before dawn. With each step, the forest grew denser, the path less defined. Ranger O'Connor, however, seemed to know the way, navigating with an unwavering determination. Every so often he would pause, listen carefully, and then change course, avoiding what I could only assume were areas where the creature was likely to be. His familiarity with the park was evident, but it did nothing to alleviate our fear. The hours ticked by as we trudged through the forest. Madison clung to my arm, her face pale and eyes wide with fear. The once beautiful wilderness had become a terrifying labyrinth, its natural beauty cloaked in darkness and danger. Ranger O'Connor's warning rang in my ears. Whatever you do, don't answer it. It'll mimic our voices, our laughter, our screams. It wants you to engage, to make you vulnerable. Remember, silence is our defense. Yet in the silence, the chilling laughter, the horrifying mimicry seemed all the more potent. It felt as though the forest itself was conspiring against us, a horrifying entity that had us in its chilling grip. The night wore on, our once peaceful camping trip now a desperate struggle for survival. The serene beauty of the National Park had given way to an unspeakable terror, a nightmare that unfolded with each step we took. Little did we know, the real test of our courage was yet to come, and the sinister secrets of the forest were waiting to be unveiled. Just when we thought we could bear no more, we stumbled upon an old cabin nestled between towering trees. Despite its dilapidated condition, it offered a refuge from the unseen terror that lurked outside. The ranger's face lit up at the sight of it, and he quickly ushered us inside. It belonged to an old friend, he explained, bolting the door behind us. It's not much, but it's safer than the forest. As we caught our breath, Ranger O'Connor began to share more about the legend of the Skinwalker, a story he'd heard from the park's Native American guides. He explained that these creatures were once humans, who through dark rituals, gained the ability to shapeshift, taking the form of any animal they chose. His words hung heavy in the air, filling the silence of the cabin with a chill that seemed more potent than the cold outside. Yet the more he spoke, the more our encounters lined up with the legend, the mimicry, the deer-like creature, the chilling laughter, it all made a terrifying sort of sense. Legend says they can control your mind, Ranger O'Connor continued. That's why they mimic human voices. They're trying to lure you into their control. The thought sent a shudder down my spine. The idea of losing control, of becoming a puppet to some ancient malevolent entity, was the stuff of nightmares. The Ranger also explained that skinwalkers were bound to the land, trapped within the park's boundaries by ancient rituals. Our goal was clear. We needed to cross those boundaries before dawn. Despite the fear, a newfound determination took hold. We were not just hapless victims, lost in the wilderness. We were survivors, fighting an ancient evil, a fight we were determined to win. We had come too far, 
experienced too much to let this creature win. Outside, the forest seemed to groan under the weight of our resolve. The wind howled, shaking the cabin's frail structure, as if warning us of the trials that lay ahead. But we were prepared to face whatever the night had in store for us, armed with newfound knowledge and fueled by a fierce will to survive. We waited for what seemed like an eternity, each minute stretching out, filled with a tense anticipation. When the ranger finally gave the signal to move, we were ready, stepping back into the night with a grim determination. The path to freedom was clear, but the journey was far from over. As we ventured deeper into the darkness, we knew we were stepping into the lair of the beast, facing an ancient entity that did not want us to leave. It was a showdown between humanity and the supernatural, a battle for survival, and we were at the center of it. Venturing back into the forest, we moved stealthily, the darkness a double-edged sword, shielding us from the creature yet veiling our path in obscurity. Our senses heightened, every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig was amplified, echoing our pounding heartbeats. We weren't just a couple of campers anymore, and Ranger O'Connor wasn't just a park ranger. We were warriors, stealing ourselves for a confrontation with the unknown, fighting not just for our lives, but for our sanity. There was a distinct change in the forest. The once calming silence was now suffused with an eerie stillness, an ominous quiet that seemed to warn of an impending storm. We were deep in its territory now, I thought, the creature's realm. Suddenly, a chilling scream rent the silence, echoing through the trees. It was Madison's scream, or rather, an unsettling imitation of it. It came from our right, drawing our attention to the dense underbrush. In that moment, we knew. The creature was near. But before we could react, another scream came from our left, identical in its chilling intensity. It was playing with us, I realized, using our own voices against us, trying to instill fear, sow confusion. Ranger O'Connor signaled us to form a triangle, our backs to each other, flashlights illuminating the immediate vicinity. The plan was clear. We were to keep our focus outward, protect each other, not let the creature catch us off guard. The screams continued, growing louder, closer. It was as if the forest was alive, pulsating with the horrifying sounds, the mimicry reaching a terrifying crescendo. Then, breaking through the brush, the deer-like creature appeared, its eerily human eyes gleaming in the harsh beam of our flashlights. It looked at us, its gaze jumping from one terrified face to the other, and then it began to morph, its form shifting in a grotesque display, its shape becoming less animal more human. I felt Madison's grip on my arm tighten, her body shaking next to mine. Ranger O'Connor stepped forward, his hand firmly on the hilt of his silver knife, an item he'd revealed earlier, said to be effective against skinwalkers according to the lore. He shouted a phrase in an indigenous language, his voice strong and clear. The creature recoiled as if in pain, a hideous growl emanating from it. The battle of wills had begun. I felt my fear ebbing, replaced with a fierce determination. We would not be preyed upon, not be driven to insanity. We were going to get out of this damn forest and put this terrifying nightmare behind us. For now, we held our ground, our eyes locked on the creature, the standoff under the shadowy canopy reaching its peak. With the creature momentarily subdued, Ranger O'Connor ordered us to move, leading the way through the undergrowth. I glanced back, catching one last glimpse of the creature writhing in pain, its form blurring and shifting. The sight was both horrifying and enthralling, an unforgettable testament to the ancient legends that I once scoffed at. The forest seemed to close in around us as we dashed through the thick undergrowth, the wild beauty that had once drawn us now taking on a more sinister hue. Every tree, every rock, every shadow seemed threatening, part of a nightmarish world we were desperate to escape. The screams and laughter followed us, a macabre symphony of our own voices echoing around us. I felt a shiver crawl up my spine. It felt as though the very air around us was saturated with fear, the creature's presence lingering like a fog. But the sight of the park entrance, illuminated by the first rays of dawn, filled me with a renewed sense of hope. The boundary that Ranger O'Connor spoke of was in sight, a mere hundred yards away. The thought of leaving this nightmare behind propelled me forward, pushing the exhaustion to the back of my mind. Just when I thought we had made it, an agonizing scream cut through the morning calm. I turned around to see Madison frozen in place, her eyes wide with terror, 
staring at something behind me. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed her gaze, dreading the sight that awaited me. The creature had re-emerged from the forest, its form more grotesque and terrifying than before. It was a horrifying blend of man and beast, its once deer-like form now tainted with an abhorrent mockery of human features. Its eyes, filled with a chilling malice, were locked onto us, and it was closing in fast. Summoning the last bit of my energy, I grabbed Madison's hand and we ran, pushing ourselves towards the park entrance. Ranger O'Connor was right behind us, his silver knife at the ready, his face set in a determined grimace. The boundary was just a few feet away when the creature let out a roar so powerful it seemed to shake the very ground beneath us. But we didn't stop, didn't look back. We crossed the boundary, stumbling onto the paved road that marked the park's entrance, just as the sun broke through the horizon. I turned back to see Ranger O'Connor standing at the boundary, the creature halted just inches from him. It seemed to be struggling, its form flickering and contorting, as if it was unable to cross the boundary. Ranger O'Connor held his ground, his silver knife gleaming in the morning light. With one last agonizing howl, the creature retreated, disappearing into the dense forest. Ranger O'Connor turned to us, a weary smile on his face. We had made it. We had survived the night, escaped the clutches of the skinwalker. We had braved the ancient evil of the forest and lived to tell the tale. As the morning sun cast away the shadows of the forest, the night's terrifying ordeal felt almost unreal. But the lingering fear, the memory of the creature's horrifying gaze, was proof enough that the nightmare had been real. We had delved into the realm of the unknown, faced an ancient supernatural entity, and emerged victorious, forever changed. As we trudged away from the park, my mind was a whirlwind of chaotic thoughts. Our camping trip had spiraled into a supernatural battle for survival, an encounter with an ancient entity that was beyond my wildest imaginations. The trauma of the night left a deep imprint, the chilling mimicry of our voices still echoed in my ears, and the sight of the skinwalker still haunted my vision. Ranger O'Connor led us to a nearby ranger station, offering us a place to recuperate and process the terrifying ordeal. We were given warm clothes, hot food, and a chance to share our unbelievable story. As we recounted the events, the reality of what we had experienced began to sink in. We were survivors of a legend that few lived to tell. The thought was as terrifying as it was fascinating. We were a part of something much larger than ourselves, witnesses to an ancient supernatural phenomenon. We weren't just ordinary campers anymore. We were survivors, forever changed by an encounter that had pushed us to our limits and challenged our understanding of reality. The bond between Madison and I had grown stronger in the face of adversity, our shared trauma bringing us closer than we'd ever been. Days turned into weeks as we tried to assimilate back into our ordinary lives, but the memories of the park, the terrifying creature, and the desperate struggle for survival were etched deep into our minds. The world felt different, tainted by the knowledge of the supernatural lurking in the shadows. We found solace in each other, sharing our fears and nightmares, supporting each other through the healing process. We were more than just a couple now. We were partners, bound by a shared experience that had shaken us to our core. Ranger O'Connor became a regular part of our lives, a pillar of strength in our recovery process. He helped us navigate the aftermath, understand the enormity of our experience, and reconcile with our new reality. Despite the terror of the incident, I found a strange sense of empowerment. We had faced a supernatural entity, endured its mind games, and survived. It was a testament to our strength, a proof of our resilience. The thought was liberating, filling me with a newfound appreciation for life and its inherent unpredictability. Life moved on, but the shadow of the incident lingered. We found comfort in the mundane, solace in routine, peace in the small moments of joy. We found a way to transform our trauma into strength, channeling our fear into understanding. As I look back now, the terrifying experience feels like a distant nightmare, yet it continues to shape our lives. We bear the scars, both mental and physical, reminders of the terrifying ordeal. We are survivors, forever bound by the terrifying encounter with the skinwalker, forever haunted by the echoes of that horrifying night in the National Park. A year had passed since our horrifying ordeal, 
The anniversary prompted mixed feelings, fear, sadness, but also resilience and hope. We had come so far, yet the come so shadows of our experience still hovered over us. Madison and I decided to return to the park, not to relive the terror, but to find some sense of closure. We drove to the park, the familiar landscape stirring a turmoil of emotions. Ranger O'Connor joined us, his presence a source of comfort amidst the rising tide of anxiety. This time we were not stepping into the wilderness unprepared. We were not oblivious campers anymore. We were survivors, returning to face our past. Approaching the boundary, my heart pounded in my chest. The forest was as beautiful and ominous as I remembered, but I felt different. This time I held Madison's hand, not in fear, but in solidarity. We walked past the boundary, the morning sun warming our faces, a stark contrast to the night of our ordeal. We stood in silence, taking in the sights and sounds. A sense of tranquility washed over me. This was the same forest, the same beautiful wilderness we had set out to explore a year ago, but it felt different. The forest no longer held the same power over us. It was just a forest, wild and beautiful. We paid our respects to the lives lost to the skinwalker, including the park's Native American guides, whose stories had saved us. We held a small ceremony, Ranger O'Connor leading us in a traditional Native American prayer. It was a poignant moment, a tribute to those who had fallen to the ancient entity, a reminder of the thin line between the natural and the supernatural. After the ceremony, we explored the park, visited the spot where we had first set up camp, even dared to walk towards the old cabin. The cabin stood desolate and empty, a reminder of our desperate struggle for survival. But it no longer instilled fear. It was a part of our journey, a piece of our shared history. As we retraced our steps, reliving the events of that night, the terrifying memories began to lose their power over us. They were a part of us, yes, but they no longer defined us. They were reminders of our survival, of our resilience, of our strength. Returning to the park felt like coming full circle. We had faced our fears, stood in the place of our deepest terror, and we had not faltered. The forest, the cabin, even the memory of the creature, it all felt less daunting. We had looked our nightmare in the eye, and we had emerged victorious. That night, we camped under the stars, not far from the park entrance. The forest was eerily silent, just as it had been a year ago. But this time, the silence didn't terrify us. We lay there, under the vast open sky, the past and the present colliding in a moment of tranquility. As we stared into the night, I felt a sense of peace. We had returned to the scene of our nightmare, faced our past, and found closure. We had taken back control, rewriting the narrative of our experience. We were no longer victims of the skinwalker. We were survivors, forever changed, but ultimately, stronger. In the quiet solitude of our campsite, under a blanket of countless stars, I reflected on the journey Madison and I had undertaken. From the innocuous beginning of a camping trip to the terrifying encounter with the supernatural, we had traveled a path that was as horrifying as it was enlightening. Ranger O'Connor was with us, sitting quietly by the campfire, lost in his own thoughts. I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of gratitude for him. His wisdom, his strength, and his unwavering bravery had been our beacon in the darkest of times. The morning sun painted the sky with hues of pink and gold, casting long shadows across the wilderness. It was a new day, a new beginning. As we packed up our camping gear, preparing to leave the park once again, I felt a strange sense of contentment. This time, we were not escaping a nightmare. We were walking away having faced our past, having made peace with our terrifying experience. We were leaving stronger, more resilient, with a newfound appreciation for life and its strange, unpredictable twists. Driving away from the park, the forest shrinking in the rearview mirror, I realized the profound transformation we had undergone. We had not just survived a supernatural entity, we had survived our own fears, our own insecurities. We had faced the darkest corners of our minds, and we had emerged victorious. As the miles grew between us and the park, I thought about the skinwalker. The ancient entity, the embodiment of fear and malice, was a part of our story. It had chased us, haunted us, tried to break us. But in doing so, 
It had also shown us our strength, our resilience, our capacity to love and protect each other. Life carried on. We returned to our jobs, our routines, our normal lives, but we were different. We were more understanding, more patient, more appreciative of the little joys of life. We had seen the worst, and it had made us appreciate the best. Madison and I grew closer, our shared experience strengthening our bond. We started volunteering at the local nature conservation program, sharing our love for the outdoors with others. Ranger O'Connor often joined us, sharing his stories, his knowledge, his wisdom. Despite the terror, despite the nightmares, I wouldn't change a thing. Our encounter with the Skinwalker, our night of terror in the park, it had all led us here. It had made us who we were, stronger, braver, and more connected. It was a chapter in our life, a story we would carry with us, a story we would pass on. As I look back now, I see not just a horrifying ordeal, but a journey of transformation. We had stepped into the unknown, faced an ancient supernatural entity, and we had come out stronger. The skinwalker, the forest, the night of terror, it was all a part of our past. But now, it was time for new beginnings, for new stories, for a future built on strength, love, and resilience. And for that, I was ready. A swift and steady rhythm pulsed through Charles Wentworth's veins as he stepped out of his car, lacing up his sturdy hiking boots and taking a deep breath of the crisp morning air. Hadley National Park stretched out before him, an infinite expanse of verdant landscapes and winding trails. His heart fluttered in anticipation, each beat whispering promises of solitude and rejuvenation. Overhead, a pair of hawks circled, their sharp cries echoing off the park's weathered wooden sign. Charles checked his backpack one last time. A week's worth of provisions, a map, a compass, and his trusty Swiss army knife. All the necessities for a solo trek through the wilderness. He ran his fingers over the map, tracing the well-known trail he intended to follow. All right, Charles, let's do this, he muttered to himself, crossing the threshold from paved road to the narrow dirt trail. Instantly, a blanket of serenity draped over him as if the trees whispered their welcome in the soft rustling of leaves. He loved this initial stage of any hike, the gradual transformation of the familiar to the unfamiliar, civilization's clamor fading into nature's tranquil symphony. Birds chattered in the canopy above, while squirrels skittered up tree trunks, their tiny claws scratching rhythmically against the bark. The air was cool and fresh, carrying with it the aroma of damp earth, pine, and wildflowers. After several miles, Charles took a break at an overlook, perched high above a rushing river. He watched as the sun spilled its golden light over the forest, painting the landscape with vibrant hues of green and gold. He felt his soul drink in the beauty, his heart echoing the thrum of the natural world around him. The day passed leisurely as Charles made steady progress, his experienced feet moving with ease over the uneven terrain. He appreciated the solitary moments the peace of his thoughts, the harmony between his heartbeat and the rhythm of his footsteps. The wilderness was an old friend, offering comfort and solitude to the weary traveler. As he made camp for the night, cooking a simple meal over a small fire, Charles took a moment to appreciate the quiet solitude that was his alone to enjoy. His gaze drifted over the vast expanse of the park, a mosaic of shadows and moonlight, vibrant and alive. He felt the hum of the city, with all its chaos and noise, start to recede from his consciousness, replaced by the rustling of leaves, the crackle of his fire, and the distant hoot of an owl. He was alone in the vastness of Hadley National Park, a solitary figure amid the ancient trees and rolling hills, but he wasn't lonely. He was at home. Retreating into his tent, Charles settled into his sleeping bag, his mind filled with the anticipation of the days to come. The forest crooned a lullaby of distant animal sounds and rustling leaves, lulling him into a peaceful sleep. Unbeknownst to Charles, this would be his last peaceful night, for his week-long journey was about to take a turn he could never have anticipated. The wilderness had plans of its own, and soon, the boundaries of his reality would blur, giving way to a terrifying adventure he would never forget. Charles woke to a world bathed in soft morning light filtering through the canvas of his tent, the tranquility of the previous night carried into the early hours, 
lending the forest a hushed serenity. Pulling on his boots and packing his belongings, he set out for another day of solitary exploration. However, the peace of the morning would not last. Peace of peace. Charles felt at first as a chill running down his spine, a drop in the air's temperature, and a sudden silence in the usually vibrant forest. He looked up to see dark clouds gathering in the sky, swallowing the blue in an ominous dance of grays and blacks. An unexpected storm was brewing, and Charles was caught in its path. Having grown up in the Pacific Northwest, Charles knew well enough the unpredictability of mountain weather. But even with his experience, he was taken aback by the storm's sudden onslaught. He barely had time to pull on his waterproof gear before the heavens opened, unleashing a deluge of cold, lashing rain. The once clear trail morphed into a muddy stream under the torrent, the trail markers obscured by the sheets of rain and mist. Charles pushed on, hoping to find a safer and drier spot. But the storm showed no mercy. It seemed to be waging a war, each gust of wind, each clap of thunder a weapon against his steady progress. He was losing his bearings, the once familiar path now a chaotic canvas of wind-tossed foliage and thrashing branches. His heart pounded in his chest, the serenity of the previous day now replaced by an instinctive dread. Disoriented and soaked to the bone, Charles moved blindly through the tempest, his experienced hiker's instinct the only compass he had left. The rain was unrelenting, its steady rhythm a stark contrast to the erratic pounding in his chest. The world had reduced to a whirlwind of wind and water, his vision limited to the few feet of sodden ground before him. His mind started playing tricks on him. Trees bending and twisting in the wind seemed to reach out, their claw-like branches grasping at him. What once appeared friendly and familiar was now a hostile, alien landscape. He missed the turn he was supposed to take, instead following a path he thought was right, a path that led him further into the heart of the storm and the unknown wilderness of Hadley National Park. As daylight waned, the storm continued its wild rampage. Exhausted, drenched, and completely off his planned trail, Charles was lost. He knew he needed to find shelter, to wait out the storm and hopefully regain his bearings. But in this weather, with night creeping in, the task seemed daunting. Despite his dire predicament, Charles couldn't afford to panic. He moved onwards, driven by a survival instinct honed by years of wilderness exploration. Every step was a struggle against the storm, a plea to the unforgiving wilderness. Little did he know that his plea would be answered, not in the form of familiar comfort, but as an old abandoned cabin nestled deep within the wilderness of Hadley National Park. The stage was set for a harrowing journey that would challenge his very perception of reality. The downpour was relentless, each drop a freezing needle piercing his soaked clothing. His world had reduced to this symphony of chaos, each footstep forward an act of sheer will. It was then, in the middle of the pandemonium, that Charles saw it, a silhouette barely distinguishable through the torrential rain. It was a cabin, standing eerily silent amidst the storm's tumult. The sight of the cabin brought him a flicker of hope. Charles hastened towards it, his fatigue momentarily forgotten. The wooden structure seemed ancient, its log walls darkened by time and weather, the roof covered in layers of moss. It was old, yes, but it promised refuge from the storm. As he pushed open the creaky door, a rush of stale, musty air greeted him. He stepped inside, shedding his soaked outer layer and backpack onto the floor. The cabin was furnished minimally, a table, a chair, a worn-out couch, and a fireplace filled with ash from long-extinct fires. Cobwebs clung to the corners, a testament to its prolonged disuse. Charles fumbled in his backpack for a flashlight. As the beam cut through the cabin's darkness, it revealed a space that was claustrophobic, yet somehow vast, filled with shadows and years of neglect. Despite its desolation, the cabin was a welcome haven from the storm. Working quickly, he started a fire in the hearth, using his emergency fire starter and a few pieces of old dry wood he found. Soon, a warm glow filled the cabin, pushing back the shadows. As he sat by the fire, savoring its warmth, Charles allowed himself a moment of relief. He was off course and lost, but he was safe and dry for now. He rummaged through his backpack for a small camping stove and some dehydrated food. The aroma of rehydrated beans and rice filled the cabin as he ate, the monotonous drone of the storm outside accompanying his solitary meal. 
He then set about making a makeshift bed from his sleeping bag and a dusty old blanket he found in a corner. The cabin, despite providing much needed shelter, had an unsettling aura. A sense of desolation hung in the air, heavier than the damp and the cold. An old weathered painting of the park hung crookedly on one wall, the only adornment in the otherwise Spartan room. As Charles studied the painting, he felt a strange unease creeping in. He shook off the feeling, attributing it to the storm and his unfortunate predicament. Yet as he slid into his sleeping bag, the feeling remained, a quiet undercurrent to the storm's symphony outside. He was not alone. The cabin held an unspoken history, its silence resonating with stories of the past. As Charles drifted into an uneasy sleep, he remained unaware of how entwined his future would become with this seemingly innocuous refuge. This was not merely a respite from the storm, it was the beginning of an experience that would challenge his courage, his sanity, and his very understanding of the world around him. The cabin in the woods, nestled deep within the heart of Hadley National Park, was about to become the epicenter of his darkest fears. Charles awoke abruptly, the fire in the hearth reduced to a smoldering pile of glowing embers. The storm had lessened, replaced by an unnatural silence. He lay still, listening to the quiet punctuated only by the sporadic creaking of the cabin settling into the darkness. He had slept, yes, but it had been a fitful slumber, filled with strange, unnerving dreams. His gaze wandered around the dimly lit cabin, the fire's embers casting long dancing shadows on the walls. Each shadow seemed to twist and contort, as if coming alive. Dismissing his imagination, Charles decided to stoke the fire. The sound of his boots against the wooden floor seemed amplified in the silence, the echo filling the cabin. As he was tending to the fire, he heard it, a soft whisper. His heart pounded as he froze, his hand still clutching a piece of firewood. He scanned the room, but nothing seemed out of place. It must have been the wind, he reasoned or perhaps the cabin's old timber frame playing tricks. Reassured, he returned to his sleeping bag, closing his eyes against the dim glow of the fire. Just as he was drifting back to sleep, he heard it again. A whisper, softer this time, like the rustling of leaves or a breath against his ear. A chill ran down his spine as he sat upright, his eyes wide in the fire-lit room. The room remained silent, save for the faint crackling of the fire. The shadows, however, appeared to move more restlessly, fueled by the flickering light. He watched as a small wooden figurine on the mantel shifted ever so slightly. His heart pounded in his chest, the rational part of his mind battling with the primal fear taking hold. Deciding to inspect the figurine, he moved closer and realized it was a simple carving of a hiker. It seemed ordinary, and yet something about it sent a shiver down his spine. As he reached out to touch it, a sudden gust of wind blew the cabin door open with a loud creak, making him jump. The wind howled as it rushed through the cabin, extinguishing the fire and plunging the room into darkness. Charles stood frozen, his mind racing. As quickly as it started, the wind died down, the door creaking shut once again. With his heart pounding, Charles quickly relit the fire, its glow pushing back the pressing darkness. He retreated to his sleeping bag, his eyes wide and alert. A strange sense of dread filled him as if he was intruding on something, or something was intruding on him. The rest of the night was a blur of fitful sleep and strange occurrences. He could have sworn he saw the shadows move, heard whispers in the silence, and felt an unnerving sensation of being watched. But by morning, everything seemed ordinary again, the cabin bathed in the soft, early light. Yet Charles couldn't shake off the unsettling events of the night. As he stepped outside to greet the day, he couldn't help but wonder if he had stepped into a world far removed from the natural wilderness he had known. Little did he know, the true terror was yet to begin. The morning sun greeted Charles with a stark contrast to the haunting memories of the night before. The storm had passed, leaving in its wake a renewed landscape of glistening foliage and sparkling dewdrops. Yet, the memory of the cabin's eerie whispers and moving shadows still lingered in his mind casting a pall over the pristine wilderness. Determined to regain his bearings and rejoin his planned trail, Charles decided to leave the unsettling cabin behind. He spent the early hours studying his map, comparing it with the natural landmarks he could discern from his current location. But the more he looked, the more his confusion grew. 
The map did not match what he saw. The landmarks were there, but they were wrong. Unsettled, he decided to explore the surrounding area, hoping that a closer inspection would solve the mystery. He walked for three hours, scrutinizing the terrain, the arrangement of trees, and the layout of the trails. But instead of finding clarity, he found more anomalies. The river that was supposed to flow east was flowing west. A hill that should have been covered in pine trees was devoid of any vegetation. And the most unsettling discovery was the sudden appearance of a sheer rock face where, according to the map, there should have been a gradual slope. Every familiar landmark was twisted, every direction skewed. It was as if the very fabric of the park had been rearranged while he slept, warping the familiar landscape into an unrecognizable jumble. The wilderness he knew like the back of his hand had become an unsolvable labyrinth. And with every passing moment, Charles felt a growing unease, an instinctive fear that he was not simply lost, but trapped in something far beyond his understanding. With a sinking heart, he realized his only option was to return to the cabin. It was the only identifiable point in this twisted version of Hadley National Park, his only anchor in a world that had stopped making sense. As the cabin came into sight, an unexplainable dread washed over him. It stood there silent and seemingly innocuous, yet it held an invisible power, a cryptic aura that made his skin crawl. It was no longer just a shelter from the storm, it had become the epicenter of his nightmare. Reluctantly, he made his way inside, the musty smell of old wood and damp earth filling his nostrils. As he looked around, he couldn't help but feel the cabin was waiting for him as if it had expected his return. The tiny wooden hiker figurine sat innocuously on the mantel, its presence a chilling reminder of the previous night. As the sun began to set, painting the sky in hues of oranges and purples, Charles prepared for another night in the cabin. He steeled himself for the upcoming hours of darkness, the unspoken promise of unexplainable occurrences hanging heavily in the air. His situation was dire. He was lost in a wilderness that had turned on its head, with only a haunted cabin for refuge. As he settled down by the fire, he knew his ordeal was far from over. It had only just begun. Night fell on the park like a shroud, the lingering daylight swallowed by the growing shadows. Charles steeled himself, his mind churning with thoughts of the previous night's events. As the fire crackled in the hearth, the shadows danced along the cabin's walls, giving life to his growing fears. He had noticed earlier, while still daylight, the faded and frayed journal he had overlooked before. Now, with nothing else to do but wait for the whispers of the night, he decided to examine it. The journal was old, its pages yellowed and brittle. It appeared to be a hiker's journal, filled with scribbles and sketches of the park's features. As Charles leafed through it, his interest peaked. It was not just any hiker's journal. It belonged to someone who had experienced the same anomalies as him. The entries were erratic, speaking of familiar trails suddenly becoming alien, of landmarks appearing where they shouldn't be, of the chilling whispers that haunted the cabin. He read an entry about a whispering wind that sounded like a distressed plea, about a shadow that moved of its own accord, about a growing sense of dread that consumed the hiker's sanity. It was as if the author of the journal had put down into words what Charles had been feeling but could not articulate. The fear, the confusion, the desperation, it was all there, etched into the yellowed pages. A shiver ran down his spine as he read the last entry. The cabin is not what it seems. I can hear them. The whispering won't stop. They're watching. The entry ended abruptly, the pen trailing off the page, as if the author had been interrupted. The whispers of the wind outside seemed to grow louder as he closed the journal, the words echoing in his mind. He stared into the fire, lost in thought. His feeling of dread was mirrored in the pages of the journal, his predicament not as unique as he had believed. Someone had been here before him, lost and terrified. As he sat contemplating, he heard it again, the whisper, soft and faint, but unmistakable. A chill ran down his spine as he turned towards the source, the small wooden figurine on the mantle. His heart pounded in his chest, the whispers growing louder, the shadows seeming to pulsate around the figurine. Overwhelmed, he stumbled back, his eyes fixed on the figurine. The whispers grew into a cacophony, the cabin's walls reverberating with an eerie symphony of unrecognizable voices. Charles fell to his knees, his mind a whirl of terror, 
as the cabin came alive with the haunting sounds of the night. As the terrifying spectacle subsided, he was left panting, cold sweat dripping down his brow. The cabin was silent once more, but the echo of the whispers lingered in his mind. The night was far from over, and Charles knew he was now a prisoner of the cabin and its haunting mystery, just like the author of the journal. The second night in Hadley National Park had claimed him, and there was no escape in sight. In the aftermath of the haunting whispers, Charles was left shaken, his heart pounding against his ribs. He was trapped in a nightmare, his only connection to the world outside being a journal that narrated a tale eerily similar to his own. With a deep breath, he decided to examine the journal again. He had to make sense of it for his sanity and his survival. The early entries of the journal were mundane, filled with the joy of exploring nature, detailed observations of flora and fauna, and intricate sketches of the park's landmarks. As he leafed through it, he noticed the tone of the entries gradually changing, becoming more desperate, more fearful. The joyous adventure had turned into a living nightmare for the writer, mirroring his own experience. A particular entry caught his attention, one that spoke about the small wooden figurine. The figure whispers, I hear it, it has a voice, a voice from the past, a voice from the heart of the park. The figurine, just like the one that rested on the mantle, seemed to be at the heart of the mystery. Intrigued yet terrified, Charles carefully picked up the figurine. It was simple, but there was a strange energy radiating from it, a kind of primal force that seemed to reverberate with the whispers from the previous night. It felt cold to touch, and he felt a jolt, like a faint electric shock, pulsating through his fingers. As he held it, he heard them again, the whispers. But this time they were clearer, more distinct. It was not just a single whisper, but many voices, each narrating a different tale. They were not threats or curses, but stories, fragments of lives lived long ago. Charles listened, his fear subsiding, replaced by an inexplicable connection to the voices. They were telling their stories, tales of their journeys, of their joys and sorrows. Each voice seemed to be a piece of a larger puzzle, a fragment of the park's rich history that was imprinted in its very soul. As he listened, he realized that he was not alone. The park was filled with voices from the past, each a part of the grand tapestry of life that had unfolded within its boundaries. He felt an overwhelming sense of belonging, of being a part of something greater than himself. His fear was replaced by a sense of awe and wonder. But as the last whispers faded, he was left with a sense of foreboding. The final voice was different. It spoke of a curse, a dark force that had taken over the park, warping its reality and trapping the souls within it. Charles felt a shiver run down his spine. He was trapped in the park, just like the voices, bound by an ancient curse that he did not understand. His mind raced as he tried to make sense of everything. He was no longer just a lost hiker seeking refuge from a storm. He was a part of a much larger, much darker story that was unfolding within the heart of Hadley National Park. As he prepared for another night in the cabin, he knew he had to understand the curse and find a way to break it, not just for his sake, but for the voices that had found a voice through him. With the dawn of a new day, Charles was filled with determination. His fear was replaced with a newfound purpose, to break the curse that held him and the voices captive. He spent the morning meticulously going through the journal, looking for clues, for any hint that might help him understand the nature of the curse. One entry caught his attention. The river runs backwards, the sun rises in the west, Time is not as it should be. The curse has twisted it, trapped us in a loop, an eternal twilight. Charles remembered his own observations, the river flowing in the wrong direction, the sun setting where it should rise, the terrain shifting unnaturally. Inspired by the entry, he decided to investigate further. He left the cabin and made his way to the river, the journal tucked safely in his backpack. As he neared it, he noticed something strange. The river was indeed flowing backwards. But not only that, it was flowing upwards, defying gravity, twisting and curving in impossible ways, as if time and space were being warped around it. Feeling a strange pull, he reached out to touch the water. The moment his hand connected, he felt a rush of energy, a surge of voices filled his mind, stronger and louder than before. 
He saw flashes of events from the past, hikers setting up camp, families picnicking, lovers stealing a kiss under the canopy of trees, and then the storm, a tempest of dark energy spiraling and engulfing the park. The, the vision ended abruptly, leaving him dazed and trembling by the riverside. He now understood. The curse had twisted time, trapping the park and its inhabitants in a perpetual loop, an echo of their own lives replayed over and over again. He was not just lost in space, he was lost in time. Driven by a newfound understanding, Charles returned to the cabin. He pored over the journal once more, focusing on the entries that spoke of the curse. It became apparent that the curse was tied to the park itself, the natural elements embodying its power. The river, the trees, the rocks, they were all part of it, bound together in an eternal twilight. The wooden figurine seemed to be a conduit, a link between him and the trapped souls. He knew he had to use it to communicate with the voices, to understand more about the curse and how to break it. The answers were there, locked within the twisted time of Hadley National Park. As the sun began to set, Charles prepared himself. He had seen the power of the curse, the force that had warped the park and trapped the voices within its boundaries. He was a part of this twisted reality now, and it was up to him to set things right. Holding the figurine in his hand, he waited for the nightfall. He was ready to confront the curse, to face the echoes of the past, and to navigate through the warped reality of the park. The eighth night was upon him, and Charles knew it was time to unravel the mysteries of Hadley National Park. He was no longer just a lost hiker. He was the park's only hope for liberation. Nightfall arrived with an ominous chill, a palpable anticipation hanging in the air. Charles sat by the fire, holding the wooden figurine in his hand. His heart pounded in his chest as he focused on the figurine, inviting the whispers to return. As if on cue, the cabin filled with the familiar cacophony of whispers. But this time, Charles was not afraid. He allowed himself to be drawn in, to become a part of the ethereal symphony. He listened intently, focusing on the individual voices, sifting through the chaos to find the story he was seeking, the story of the curse. And then he heard it. A voice, distinct and clear, narrated a tale of an ancient tribe that had once lived in the park. The tribe had been the guardian of the park, living in harmony with nature. But their harmony had been disrupted by invaders who sought to claim the land and its resources. The tribe had fought back, and in their desperation, they had invoked an ancient spirit, a force of nature to protect the park. But the invocation had gone wrong. Instead of protecting the park, the spirit had cursed it, trapping the tribe and all those who entered the park in a loop of time. The curse had warped the reality of the park, turning it into the twisted labyrinth that Charles was experiencing. The voice then spoke of a prophecy. A stranger will come, a seeker lost in time. He will hold the key to the curse, the power to break it and set us free. He will follow the path of the river, find the heart of the park, and face the spirit. Only then will the curse be broken. The whispers faded, leaving Charles alone with the fire and the newfound knowledge. The story of the curse, the tribe, and the prophecy filled his mind his role in this grand narrative clearer than ever. He was the stranger, the seeker who was meant to break the curse. With renewed determination, Charles planned his course of action. He would follow the river as the voice had guided him, find the heart of the park, and face the ancient spirit. He was no longer a mere hiker lost in the wilderness. He was the protagonist of an epic quest, the only hope for the trapped souls. As he prepared for his journey, he felt an overwhelming sense of responsibility. But alongside it was a spark of hope, the possibility of freedom not just for himself, but for the voices, the echoes of the past. The ninth night ended with a sense of purpose, a resolve that strengthened Charles's spirit for the challenges that lay ahead. The secrets of Hadley National Park had been unveiled. The labyrinthine paths, the twisted landmarks, and the whispers all made sense now. Charles was not just lost, he was chosen. As he looked at the wooden figurine one last time before retiring for the night, he knew his journey was far from over. It was just beginning. The ninth chapter of his ordeal had ended, but the real adventure was about to start. Armed with his newfound purpose, 
Charles started his journey at dawn. With the wooden figurine in his pocket and the whispers of the past guiding him, he followed the river's twisted flow. It felt surreal, a dreamlike journey through a landscape that defied the laws of nature. As he walked, he could hear the voices encouraging him, guiding him, reminding him of his destiny. Every twist in the river, every warped tree, every misaligned boulder, they were no longer menacing anomalies. They were waypoints, guiding him to the heart of the park. Hours turned into what felt like days as he traversed the unnatural terrain. He was pushed to his physical limits, but the energy from the figurine and the guiding whispers propelled him forward. The voices shared their tales, their hopes, and their dreams, strengthening his resolve. At one point, he reached a waterfall, flowing upwards, a sight that both amazed and terrified him. But he did not falter. With a deep breath, he stepped into the waterfall, letting the reversed current guide him upwards. It was a struggle, an uphill battle against gravity and exhaustion, but he made it to the top, soaked and panting, but triumphant. As he rested, the voices comforted him, applauding his efforts and reassuring him of his path. He wasn't alone in his journey. He was surrounded by a chorus of allies, all rooting for him, all dependent on him. It was a burden, but also a privilege, a duty that he bore with a humble heart. After the rest, he resumed his journey. He moved through dense forests, scrambled over jagged rocks, and navigated through a maze of twisted paths. Despite the arduous trek, he pressed on, the wooden figurine a constant reminder of his mission. Finally, as the sun began to set in the wrong direction, he saw it, the heart of the park. It was a grove of ancient trees, their trunks twisted and gnarled, a testament to the park's distorted reality. At the center stood an enormous tree, its roots spreading in intricate patterns, its branches reaching out like an invitation. As he approached the tree, the whispers grew louder, the voices reaching a crescendo. His heart pounded in his chest, anticipation and fear mingling in his veins. This was it, the climax of his journey, the confrontation he had been preparing for. The whispers guided him, telling him to place the figurine at the base of the tree. He did as instructed, the figurine settling into the twisted roots as if it belonged there. A silence descended on the grove, a tense, anticipatory quiet. Charles took a step back, his breath hitching as he waited. The tenth night had arrived, the climax of his journey at hand. The river had guided him, the voices had supported him, and now it was time for him to face the ancient spirit, to confront the curse and hopefully to break it. As the final rays of the sun disappeared, the grove began to glow, a spectral light radiating from the figurine. Charles steeled himself for what was to come. He was ready, ready to face the spirit, ready to end the curse. The tenth chapter of his ordeal was coming to a close, but his biggest challenge was yet to come. He had reached the heart of Hadley National Park, and it was time to face its soul. The spectral light from the figurine grew stronger, casting eerie shadows across the grove. Charles watched, heart pounding, as the glow coalesced into a form, a swirling, shimmering entity that radiated an ancient, primal energy. This was the spirit, the source of the curse the entity that had twisted Hadley National Park into a labyrinth of distorted reality. It was not as he had expected. There was no malice, no evil in its presence. It was simply a force of nature, an embodiment of the park itself. Who disturbs the eternal twilight? The voice echoed through the grove, a sonorous whisper that sent chills down Charles's spine. I'm Charles, he answered, his voice steady despite his fear. I've come to break the curse to free the trapped souls. The spirit seemed to consider his words, its form pulsating with energy. Why should I grant you this wish, mortal? Why do you wish to disrupt the eternal cycle? Charles took a deep breath, gathering his thoughts. He thought of the journal, the wooden figurine, the whispered stories of the past, the twisted paths he had traversed, and the heart of the park that stood before him. I've heard their voices, their stories, he said, his voice resonating with sincerity. They deserve to be freed. They've been trapped in this cycle for too long. In the park, it's not meant to be a prison. It's meant to be a place of joy, exploration, and harmony. The spirit was silent for a moment, its form flickering as if pondering his words. And you? Do you not wish to escape? Is your desire not fueled by selfish needs? 
Charles paused, considering the spirit's words. Yes, I want to leave, he confessed. But it's not just about me. It's about them too, the voices, the souls. It's about restoring the park to its true state. I, we deserve to be free. We deserve... A moment of silence stretched between them, the grove holding its breath in anticipation. Then the spirit's form pulsed, a wave of energy rippling through the air. Your words ring true, Charles, it said, its voice soft. You possess a selflessness rare among mortals. I shall grant you your wish. The spirit reached out, a tendril of energy connecting with the figurine. The grove lit up, a burst of pure energy emanating from the spirit and enveloping Charles in the ancient tree. He felt a jolt, a rush of emotions, hope, joy, relief, fear, and finally, peace. And then, as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The spirit faded, the spectral light dimmed, leaving the grove bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight. The whispers, the echoes of the past, were silent, their stories finally finding closure. Charles stood there, awestruck, feeling the change around him. The oppressive air had lifted, replaced by a sense of tranquility. He knew in his heart that the curse was broken, the eternal twilight ended. His confrontation with the ancient spirit had brought liberation not just for him, but for the voices and the park itself. He had faced his fear, confronted the source of the curse, and emerged victorious. As the eleventh night descended, he knew his ordeal was nearing its end. He had broken the curse, and now it was time to leave Hadley National Park, to return to his own reality. But before he could do that, there was one final task left for him to complete. Charles woke up to the rising sun. The surreal twilight ambience had lifted, the morning rays spilling across the grove. The twisted paths, warped trees, and inverted landmarks had straightened out, the park returning to its natural state. It was as if he had woken up from a long, strange dream. As he looked around, he noticed the figurine was no longer glowing. It felt like an ordinary piece of wood now. He picked it up, a sense of gratitude washing over him. This little figure had been his guide, his ally in this journey. He decided to keep it, a memento of his unforgettable experience. With a final glance at the heart of the park, he started his journey back, following the river once more. But this time it was flowing in the right direction, its course clear and unhindered. The voices were silent, their stories having found closure. His hike back to the park's entrance was uneventful, almost peaceful. He felt lighter, freed from the burden of the curse. When he finally stepped out of Hadley National Park, he was greeted by a sight he had almost forgotten. Cars, tourists, park rangers. He was back to his own reality. His reappearance caused a stir among the park staff. He was declared missing weeks ago, and his sudden return was nothing short of a miracle. He kept his story to himself, knowing no one would believe him. To them, he was just a hiker who had lost his way. He made his way back to his life, resuming his mundane routine. But he was a changed man, carrying within him the echoes of an unforgettable experience. His journey through the twisted paths of Hadley National Park had taught him resilience, courage, and empathy. He had found himself in the labyrinth of distorted reality, coming out stronger and wiser. Charles often visited the park, each visit strengthening his bond with the land. He knew the truth of its past, the secret of its curse, and the voices that had been trapped in its twilight. He was the guardian of their stories, their whispering ally in the world of the living. As he stood at the entrance of the park one day, he looked at the wooden figurine in his hand. He thought of the spirit, the curse, and the liberation. The figurine was his connection to that past, a symbol of his journey. He looked at the park, the setting sun casting long shadows over the trees, a tranquil end to another day. His journey had come to an end, his ordeal over, but he would never forget the twelve nights he spent lost in Hadley National Park, the whispers that guided him, and the curse he broke. He was no longer just Charles, the man who got lost hiking. He was Charles, the man who navigated through the twisted paths of a cursed national park, broke an ancient curse, and brought liberation to trapped souls. As the final rays of the sun disappeared over the horizon, he smiled. He knew he would forever be a part of Hadley National Park, its history etched into his heart, its whispers a part of his soul. As he walked away, the wooden figurine in his pocket, he felt a sense of peace, 
a sense of closure. His story was complete. The echoes of Hadley National Park had found their voice, their liberation, and their guardian in Charles.